we know is not the Candyman that Clive Barker wrote about. Well, sort of. Candyman was based on a short story by Clive Barker entitled The Forbidden, which is set in the abandoned flats of Spectre Street Estate in Liverpool, England. Helen is a grad student who is writing a thesis on the impoverished neighborhood where the urban legend of a man is tied to a string of killings. This killer is described as a person with flesh tone, waxy yellow skin, strands of wiry hair, he has thin lips that are pale blue, and the irises of his eyes glitter a fiery ruby red. Clive Barker described the story as being driven by the lore of urban legends and the experience of horror. While the slasher and the location that we know has changed, the narrative of the story remains the same and one of the most terrifying horror icons in the last 50 years. terrifying true stories behind the origins of the Candyman that you may never have or probably heard of. Number five. Our first story is not an origin behind 1994's Candyman but an outcome from two of the origins we will discuss. Director Bernard Rose chose to refit Clive Barker's story around the inner city of Chicago and was given a tour of Cabrini Green, which was eventually chosen. Three days of filming was shot on location inside of the housing complex, despite the danger of doing so. The cast and crew actually had to negotiate with the local gang leaders who controlled Cabrini Green agreeing to put multiple residents into the film as extras in exchange for safe working conditions. Law enforcement accompanied the cast and crew during filming on location, but in plain clothes so as not to spark any violence. Tony Todd once recalled being told to watch out for snipers during production, which eventually became true to life as a production vehicle was struck by a sniper's bullet near the end of the shoot. <laughs> I just... I am completely dumbfounded by the whole, like, they had to negotiate with gang leaders and have their people be in the film just to, like, ensure that they wouldn't get killed. I'm not so sure I'd be making that film. Number four. The forbidden theme was around the lore of urban legends and how story could change from person to person. A line from the book is, I am a rumor, it's a blessed condition, believe me, to live in people's dreams, to be whispered it at the street corners, but not have to be. Bernard Rose made some changes to the aesthetics of existing urban legends. The heart of the story remained the same, including the local urban legends that influenced the story. The first everyone may have heard of, Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. The other two were based on real life stories, but with slight twists. The first being a story of an escaped patient from a mental asylum, Cropsy, who roamed the neighborhoods hunting children to abduct and kill them. This urban legend seemed to come to life in the 80s when children and young adults began to go missing in Staten Island and was later linked to Andre Rand, a convicted kidnapper and possible serial killer. The other urban legend is tied to Homie the Clown, a man who would lure kids into his white van in the streets of Chicago. Also, the 2021 Candyman film remains true to the narrative of urban legends by including the one of razor blades being hidden inside of treats. <laughs> been hiding in the walls. Ah! Yeah, did one of the Wayans brothers play Homie the Clown? Because yes, I feel Damon. Like that's what I thought. For Damon. Damon. That's what I thought. Yeah. I'm not taking you serious as a serial killer. I'm really not. 
<laughs> not when your name is only the clown. Not many serial killers choose their name. This is true. Like, letters. who the hell came up with that? Maybe he wrote a letter. Maybe he's like, I want to be called homie. <laughs> no, there's very little traces around this. That makes sense. Number three. In case you didn't know, Cabrini Green Homes existed. It was a Chicago Housing Authority public housing project in the north side of Chicago, Illinois. At its peak, Cabrini Green was home to 15,000 people. As depicted in Candyman, crime and poverty began to consume Cabrini Green, which began to take shape in the years following World War II, where several surrounding factories in the area shut down, causing thousands of people to be laid off. Soon after, the city of Chicago began reducing many of its public services like police patrols, public transit, and building maintenance. Lawns were paved over, broken exterior lights remained dark, fire damaged apartments were boarded up rather than remodeled, electrical and water utility problems were ignored, and waste disposal became so bad that at one point, garbage stacked 15 flights high in disposal chutes inside of the buildings. Waste disposal became so out of control that people began throwing their garbage off of their balconies. How did the city respond? They encapsulated the building's balconies with bars instead of addressing the issues, transforming the look of the complex into that of a prison. In 1995, the Chicago Housing Authority began tearing down the mid- and high-rise buildings of Cabrini Green, with the last building being demolished in 2011, leaving only the original two-story row houses that are seen in 2021's Candyman. Number two. Crime was equally as bad. The buildings were divided up between rival gangs and the residents were forced to align with the gangs in exchange for their own protection. The full truth behind the horrors of Caprini Green will always remain hidden. In 1970, two Chicago police officers that were working an outreach program with residents were caught between the crossfire of two buildings and murdered. After 11 murders in the early part of 1981, Chicago Mayor Jane Byrne moved into a Caprini Green apartment to make a statement and fight for change. She lasted three weeks. In the film, Bernadette tells Helen... Yeah, no kidding. I won't even drive past there. Heard a kid got shot there the other day. Ironically, six days prior to the film's release in 1992, seven-year-old Dontrell Davis was struck down by a sniper while walking to school with his mother. Wow, you know, snipers in housing complexes in the United States, this is something that you would see on the news in other countries, but it happens here. Number one. Ruthie Mae McCoy was struggling with mental illness and would later be diagnosed with residual type schizophrenia. Ruthie was living in a different public housing complex located near Cabrini Green. On April 22, 1987, the Chicago PD received a frantic phone call from Ruthie that people threw the cabinet down and were coming through the bathroom. The dispatcher labeled the call as a disturbance, thus lowering the level of the urgency of the call. Several gunshots followed Ruthie's call, which prompted more calls to the local police department. When they eventually did arrive on scene, Ruthie never answered the door, so they left. Over the next few days, several welfare checks were made by the police. But like before, the police arrived and left when she failed to respond to their knocks. A few days later, an odor began to emanate from her apartment, and when police finally entered her residence, Ruthie was found in her room in a pool of blood, shot multiple times. It was also discovered that the people coming through the bathroom had broken into her apartment from behind the bathroom medicine cabinet that hung on the wall. This, like many of the stories of Cabrini Green, would have been forgotten if it hadn't been for Candyman's depiction of this story. We see this incorporated in the film, and it is one of the more terrifying scenes of the film. Knowing about these stories on top of the Candyman, movie makes it only that much more horrific. If you're watching this as it drops on Wednesday of this week, Michael Hargrove from Candyman 2021, he played Sherman Fields. 
he will be on Donna June's Coffee House of Horror, and it will be his last ever interview in regards to Candyman. So it is Candyman week, so be sure to stop by and check that out. If you're seeing this afterwards, go check out that interview. It's a pretty good one. Yeah, he's a really cool guy. He is. I liked him. He thought I was drinking a beer. I wasn't. <laughs> Anyway, it is the quest for 5,000 subscribers, so please help us get there by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Yes. Remember, sharing really is caring, because if you share and someone sees it, then they'll subscribe. Yes, and as you drop a like and a comment on the video, it helps expand the audience who gets to see these videos pop up in their feed related to other topics and also helps us to shine a light on independent filmmakers and artists in some of our other videos. And along the way, for every video that gets 100 likes, 100 comments, you will win a prize. And when we hit 5,000, you have a chance to win this box of strawberries and scream cereal signed by David Arquette and Matthew Lillard. So, until the next Pop 5, see, see ya. ya.